I'll hand it over to you. Welcome, Sergeant Ken. And welcome everyone who's tuning in to Strength in a Storm, How to Find Fortitude in the Face of Fear. Stephen Furtick is a superb speaker that I follow. Recently, he talked about the rumble that we are all hearing right now, you know, and some actually are saying. He said, I'm waiting for everything to get back to normal. Getting back to normal. I get it. I too miss normal. I mean, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. The problem, this, this pandemic problem has pushed us into a bit of panic and so for some of us paranoia. And just when we thought things were getting back to a new growth groove, several storms and two tornadoes hit Nashville, Tennessee on Sunday, 03 May, 2020 eliminating the power for over 100,000 people, me included. My family and I have been without power for a few days now with no end in sight, where the workers have said it could be as much as a month. I have a two-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old son, a loving wife, and I've been in survival mode since the quarantine took what we can consider our freedom and our perception of what we thought was our new normal. And now while planning these virtual presentations for several projects, I've been in another round of survival mode, rerouting our refrigerator from the power grid to a Ryobi generator, placing 100 watt solar panels on the porch to power small devices, cooking the morning oatmeal on a compact camping burner, boiling additional water for the daily baths for the kids, fueling the generator, you get the picture. Hear me when I say, normal, left the building a long time ago. If anyone else feels the same way that I do right now, can you please put a yes in the chat section right now? Okay, all right. I see that I'm not the only one that feels this way. Missing normal. But you see, the thing is this, you never know how much you need normal until you are forced to live without it. You may have noticed that the same people that are complaining about getting back to normal are also the people that were quite vocal about their lives. Some of the stuff that you are wishing for right now are the things <laughs> you were wishing you weren't a slave to before. So, how do we turn our frustration into fascination? How do we go from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset when the world around us is constantly changing? In the midst of this mayhem, my, my 10 year old son Anderson hugged me and said, Daddy, I'm, I'm so glad you are home. Now, let me tell you a little bit of a background part to this. You see, my, you know, prior to the COVID crisis, uh, I've been traveling roughly 280 days a year to 34 countries, teaching boot camp uh, so that people can have, uh, you know, thriving businesses. And so now that we're all in sort of either in GCQ, uh, which is general community quarantine, or ECQ, enhanced community quarantine, you know, I've been spending more time with my family than I've been probably spending in the last six years, in the last six weeks. And it's been an amazing journey. But it's also been quite stressful, to say the least. And here is my son. He, he hugged me and said, Daddy, I'm so glad that you're home. His soothing embrace and warm words made me surrender to the frantic feelings I was overwhelmed with at that moment. He noticed the stress in my eyes and knew that I needed a sudden act of grace and love. See, I was shackled in my own mental prison, trying to create sensible solutions for canceled speaking events due to the virus crisis. I remember... One time when a very dear friend of mine said, we don't need to live the way the world is now. We need to live the way we want the world to be. So how do we summon strength in a storm of dread and doubt? How do we effectively lead our family and friends to solid ground when we may not have figured out how to overcome our own obstacles? How do we muster a mindset of growth and resilience in the middle of misfortune? 
How do we find fortitude in the face of fear when our roles have suddenly changed, both personally and professionally? How do we find peace in a world of problems and paranoia? Our need to adapt during difficult times is vital to living a victim or a victor mindset. Here's the thing. You don't have to have it all figured out to take the next best step forward. I say again, you don't have to have it all figured out to take, to take the next best step forward. We don't know how long the COVID crisis will uh, last. What, what we, be can, we can really be sure of, however, is that when the confirmed COVID-19 cases wane and wither away, the collateral damage that will surface in the pandemic's wake will affect some of us more than the virus itself. When I returned from the battle-hardened streets in Iraq, I was overwhelmed with post-traumatic stress disorder. I had trouble dealing with the world around me. I couldn't recognize the difference between stress and suffering. I eventually realized that while we don't always get what we want, we always get what we choose. And I told myself, I can either let this situation make me bitter or better. Your struggle today is your strength tomorrow. I say again, your struggle today is your strength tomorrow. Stress and pain can strengthen us. Suffering, however, is when you feel hopeless and helpless to manage the stress and pain in your life. And when we feel hopeless and helpless, we fall apart and seek escape. The bottom line is this. There are two things that can happen to you when you face an obstacle of any kind. Fall apart or bounce back. That's life. Resilience, offered to, referred to as emotional fitness or mental toughness, is when you face adversity head on and grow from your experience. In other words, what you go through, you grow through. Now, more than ever, is a time for us to abolish anxiety, restore resilience, and to turn adversities into advantages. Now is a time for grace, love, and exceptional leadership for our families and our friends. Now is a time to choose courage over, over comfort. I say again, now is, a now is a time, rented lips, I'll return them in the morning. Now is a time to choose courage over comfort and commitment over compromise. Now is a time for action. John C. Maxwell uh, recently said that action reduces fear and increases courage. Now is a time for resilience. You see, you can look online right now and you can see plenty of fear mongering going on. You can see it everywhere. And folks, I, I, let me give you some advice right now, right now uh, as, a, as a takeaway that's not even on the handout. If the first thing that you're doing is waking up and getting on social media right now and reacting to someone else's post, please, folks, hear me out. Someone else is running your life. That's being reactive, not proactive. That's being reactive and not proactive. The first thing that you should do when you wake up, and, and perhaps, please, I hope that once you get your mind going with maybe a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it is that you like to have a healthy intake in some way in the morning, once you get the calisthenics done or whatever, hopefully it is that you're part of your normal daily routine, the first thing that you should be doing is at least one hour, at least one hour of uninterrupted professional development. I say again, at least one hour of in uninterrupted professional development, because the more that you have in you is the more you have to offer others. And if in you're in a mode of professional development, what happens is, is that you start your day on a growth mindset. And you might even look at your goal list and say, oh my goodness, I just accomplished that already. And you start your day with this little check mark on your list. And you're starting your day with a win. Self-esteem can crush us or build us. 
And there are two types of self-esteem. There's self-efficacy, self-esteem, and self-worth, self-esteem. Self-worth is growing up with what is called perceived love. Self-efficacy, self-esteem is maybe perhaps, you know, you uh, didn't have as much perceived love in your life and you make up with it with the next A in your life, the next A in the math test at, at college or wherever it is that you're going, or, or maybe it's the next touchdown on the field, or, or maybe it's the next certification. But the thing is this, you, uh, you know, Dr. Al Siebert, who wrote the Resiliency Advantage book, really great book, he says you have to balance the, between the two or you will fail. And the thing is, if you're going on the social media right away and you're just reacting to all the fear mongering that's going on, what's going to happen is, is that it's going to kill your self-esteem and you can't have that. So instead of looking at fear as what it is to us right now, let's flip the word fear, face everything and rise. I say again, fear is face everything and rise. The bottom line is that when the crisis is passed, people might forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. People will honor you for what you did yesterday, but they will respect you for what you do today. Because what you feel is a deposit of what can be. What you feel is a deposit of what can be. All right, folks. So that's the introduction. We want to get right into the meat and potatoes of it all. And uh, so I want to ask you uh, uh, right now, if you could put in the chat bar, how are you feeling about right now about what you're receiving right now through CanFit Pro? Put in the chat bar. Tell us right now. So how are you feeling about the, uh, the, the, the initiative, what we're doing right now for this entire week for mental health? Go ahead and put it in the chat bar. And we've got our tech team and our admin team that are going to be looking at what's going on. And also to chime in when something's really resonating on your heart and it's, it's a burning question that you have to ask, please, folks, we go ahead, put it in the chat bar, and we're going to make certain we can accommodate you. We want this to be interactive, but guaranteed we're going to at least have a little chunk of time at the end of it all so that we can address some of those meaty questions. And we're going to make ourselves available for any of those follow-on questions that we couldn't address in this webinar. So again, take notes. And the thing is this, I'm telling you to take notes. I don't even know what you're doing right now. I mean, you might be... Uh, making your lunch, you might be shopping at the grocery store, whatever it is that you're doing, make certain that you immerse yourself in just a mode of impact and empowerment. And let's go on this journey of joy together. So uh, part one of this particular webinar on strength in the storm, how to find fortitude in the face of fear is, um, is an excerpt from my wife's uh, recently published book, Everything I Would Have Said, by my lovely wife, Stephanie Weikert, uh, best friend, um, companion, and mentor. So we, uh, she's just such a wonderful life coach. And she says that, you know, um, there's a three-stage behavior change model that we need to know going into situations. And so stage one uh, goes as follows. Stage one is... Choices are associated with feelings about self-worth. And I've already explained to you, you know, a quick summary about the difference between self-worth and self-efficacy, self-esteem. So stage one, again, is choices are associated with feelings about self-worth, okay? Now, stage two, choices are no longer associated with self-worth, but remain steeped in self-limiting patterns. And stage three, choices are based on personal value and long-term habits are developed from life or death principle. So let's talk about stage one a little bit uh, deeper. Let's dive into this together, okay? All right, so in the first stage, our choices and behavior are directly linked to our perception of our personal value. When we encounter an event that triggers negative emotions, we repeat old behavior patterns, which only reaffirms the negative feeling and continues the cycle. Stage two. In the second stage, we understand our fundamental feelings of unworthiness, but our self-limiting habits persist. We continue with behavior that holds us back. We may change, we may begin to change our perception of our self-worth, but we would need to purposely curtail 
his negative, the negative thought pattern of counterproductive questions. Becoming aware of our old habits helps us give power to create new ones. Stage three. The third stage is where we want to really be. I mean, it's at this stage where we recognize that we are slipping into self-limiting behavior and thinking and replace these habits with something different. We have to make a conscious effort to produce a different response pattern while, we, while still facing the same problem or, or stimulus. It doesn't mean that we don't have moments of self-doubt. That's natural. It, it's just that we choose to limit those thought patterns and actions that keep us stuck in a defeat and in a state of defeat and despair. All right, before we move on to part two, and there's only really uh, two parts and a conclusion to this webinar. Again, that should have triggered something in some of us. So use that chat bar, use that Q&A section. And if something is uh, burning on your heart, let's go ahead and address that as soon as we can. Janessa, how are we doing on the Q&A right now? Because this, right uh, this is right at the point of where I'm going to transition to some takeaways. Yeah. Um, the the Q&A, guys, oh my gosh, everyone, your, your, your sentiments, your comments, amazing. Thank you. We're so blessed to have you. So, Sergeant Ken, a couple of questions did come in. Good. Let's address those right now because, you know, that was the meat of the potatoes, and now we're going to get into some takeaways next. Yeah. So, Good. how can we help teenagers be resilient? Mm. You know, I was at a keynote just before the COVID crisis, and... Um, uh, there were four keynotes for this presentation. It was a wow, it was a wonderful opportunity. And I remember, I remember that the uh, I, I always try and stay to see the other speakers to tie in what I'm speaking about into the overall vision of the actual venue itself. And and I remember listening to this one uh, speaker. She was a, a speaker on emotional intelligence, and she got the same question: How do we deal with these millennials? All right, you know, or whatever we're actually going to call the ones that are even younger than the millennial generation, because we haven't really got a term for it yet because we we're not sure what's going to happen with them and you know um and uh she said well listen first of all you need to find what they're passionate about and then adapt all of your training materials into that passion cycle because it is a fact that when you're comparing baby boomers to millennials, and I know I'm skipping Generation X here, when you're comparing the two, she did make an astute statement saying that in the baby boomer era, we used to prepare the person for the path, but now we prepare the path for the person. It's just the way it is. It's just changing times. We, 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 we parent differently. We do things differently. And there's also a lot of compartmentalization that happens with our youth because they are really more in tune with what's going on with social media and uh, online communication. What happens is, is that could you imagine how uh, some of the adults or older adults are able to kind of ration out their responsibilities online prior to the COVID crisis that are now, right now, overwhelmed with things because they're not used to this. Whereas, you know, before what now the millennials or younger were dealing with is that, you know, they were always responding and interacting on a social media connection of some kind. But now that it's, it's, it's that they're not face to face with their friends and we're seeing a different, a different perspective. We're seeing them really craving, craving connection and starving for empathy. So, my one bit of takeaway is that find what they're passionate about. Focus on that passion. Work with that passion. You know, with my son, for example, you know, even though I know nothing about Minecraft and Roblox, he'll come up to me every now and then and say, Dad, you know, let me tell you about this one character. I said, son, that sounds like it's really important to you. And I am really, really excited to hear about that. So why don't you apply some of those great artistic skills that you got and make 
instead of baseball cards, why don't you take these three by five index cards and why don't you draw out your characters? So I was working with his passion and all of a sudden he came up to me and he showed me this entire book that he made about the characters that he created for his Minecraft and Roblox experiences. Janessa, you got another question for us? I do. They're, they are flooding in. Good. Let them flood in because this is for them. Awesome. So can you talk more about the connection between physical health and mental health? This came from Tara. Tara. And we hope it's pronounced Tara, not Tara, right? Okay. So Tara, yes, thank you. Um, you know, that's a great point. Um, because in, um, in uh, 2010, you know, I was still dealing with a little bit of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I, I wanted to be able to not only go through the healing process and on my journey and on the road to happiness as well. And um, so I had to figure out what was the connection between the emotional dimension and the physical dimension, because there is a connection. I mean, we used to call it, the, the term used to be body, mind, and spirit, body, mind, and spirit. But it really, we're defining it even more uh, uh, meticulously now more than ever because if you don't have an emotional dimension approach to what's going on in the physical dimension what's going to happen is is that they won't be impacted now here, here's what I mean so I go off to the University of Pennsylvania School of Positive Psychology and I learned from Dr. Martin Seligman who wrote the book Flourish and I learned this new concept of resilience which is one of the forms of life coaching where you focus on that everyone has stress we all have trauma but how do we turn that trauma into a tremendous experience how do we turn that stress into strength and the first thing that he said really stuck with me he says that you know fitness is in several dimensions you've got physical, nutritional, you've got emotional, that's your life coaching piece, what's going on in the heart. And if you really wanna win in life, work with your heart instead of your head, okay? And so then the social dimension, we're, we're, we are human beings, we thrive on connection, okay? Zoom stock probably has gone up and skyrocketed right now because of the COVID crisis. And it's, gonna, and it's because people are starving for connection, okay? And so it's social dimension. Then you've got the family dimension. You've gotta have that strong in your life. And the spiritual dimension. Now the spiritual dimension, here's now, I gotta really focus on that so you understand the dimensions and how they all work together here and balancing at least the focus and the question of emotional and physical together and how they can make, create a sustainment in what you're doing, okay? So again, but just to make certain I address this, that the spiritual dimension is gonna have a different meaning for everyone that's on this call right now. For me, it's my relationship with God. For you, it might be your religion or it might be meditation. But the bottom line is this, if you don't practice spiritual fitness in your life, you will fail. In other words, you've got to take time to put something back into you, a moment of rest of some kind and relying on whatever meditation or whatever spirituality that you need to put into practice so that you can build yourself up. I mean, let's uh, not to get off on a tangent, but if I were to look at the scientific metaphor right now, that if uh, I know there are a lot of people that are on this conference call right now that really love HIT, high intensity interval training. Well, let's look at the science. You've got 100% output and you've got rest, 100% rest, 100% rest. And we repeat that cycle, whatever the timing is, we repeat repeat that cycle so many times so that we can burn the stored glycogen in the body and therefore burn body fat for the next 24 to 36 hours. That's the theory of the science. Now, if I were to say to a personal trainer or group fitness instructor, of the two, of the two uh, intervals, the high output and the rest, which of the two is, is the most important? If you had to choose between the two, you would say the rest, because if without adequate rest, you can't put out 100%. Now, that was my tangent to kind of just say this. Now, let's look at all these dimensions. I'm sitting here and I'm training the Army National Guard in the state of Tennessee, and which is the reserves. I only see them two days a month. You may be, as a personal trainer, only seeing your, your, your uh, clients a couple of times a week. Who knows? And the biggest concern you have is, what are they doing during the other days that they're not in front of you? Well, here's the difference between influence and impact. 
You see, influence, you might have motivated them, but impact, you've captivated them. And when you captivate someone, what happens is, is that there's a heart change. And when there's a heart change, there's a lifestyle change. Now, here's the reason why there's an important bridge between emotional and physical readiness. Because in, when you've impacted someone, you've moved their heart, and you have a lifestyle change, you will now not be worried about what they're doing during the days that they're not in front of you. And I could see this come into play. I occasionally get uh, used to get Instagram messages like from a friend. And I remember Susan, she goes like this. She says, hey, Sergeant Ken, by the way, look at, here's a photo of me and my children and myself doing burpees on the beach in the Bahamas in the morning. And I went, well, that's kind of crazy. But at the same time, what happened is, is that they're bridging in that family family dimension, that social dimension, but it was only made possible because she somehow moved their hearts and showed them the value of what's going on. And here's the key. You don't sell features when you're trying to sell someone on your physical fitness programs. You sell solutions. For example, if I'm selling vacuum cleaners, I'm not really selling the best vacuum cleaner in the world. I'm helping people get rid of the dirt that's in their life. That's how you sell solutions. And that's the approach. And so when you've touched their hearts and you've moved them some way and you've made a lifestyle change, that's when you're going to see that they're going to be growing with you instead of you just training at them. You're going to be growing with them. That's how you will see them actually applying a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset. All right. Janessa, I think we have time for one more before we get into the next strategy. Yeah, we do. Um, so coming in from Catherine is avoidance a resilience strategy. So if somebody has a conflict avoidance personality, mm. uh, they're wondering if they're avoiding things and falling into bad habits. Mm. That, that's a wonderful question. And now I've got to preface this by saying as a, you know, it's typically uh, in positive psychology, you know, everyone's going to have a unique situation. And while I might be able to help you by giving you some takeaways that I've learned from Dr. Martin Seligman, Dr. Karen Rivich, or Dr. Al Siebert, or Valerie Burton, or any of the others, I, I got to say that, that every person's going to have a unique approach, but I do have my two cents. So my two cents, I remember, you know, when I used to have my studio in San Francisco, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, as you already know, when I used to have my studio in San Francisco, my boot camp studio, the longest running boot camp studio in the USA, 22 years of service, no break in service, running continuously. I remember that when I, at the height of my travel career, I was only visiting maybe a couple of times a year doing cameo appearances, right? And so I remember getting the, the, the back brief uh, from uh, the other instructor, and Bianca, uh, who's, uh, by the way, Bianca, who was one of my favorite instructors that worked for me at my studio, is from Saskatchewan, Canada. Go Canada! There's the flag. Go Canada. So, and I remember she was giving me a warning about the people that were in the class because I'd like to know who's in the class so I could connect with them on a very good emotional level. And she said that, oh, and this is this and this and this and this. And then she goes, oh, and by the way, um, that's Alexis. And Alexis hates human beings. Now, that was her kidding way of saying that she has... She's one of these type B personalities, an introvert that kind of takes things in. And you kind of wonder what's going on on the heart, okay? So I said, okay, let me, let me, let me deal with this. And so I'm sitting there teaching the class, running, getting back and doing some personal things in a close environment, what I call the arena stage. If you've ever been with me in my boot camp instructor certification course, that's that, that coaching uh, presence and really close to them. And I remember coming up to her in the back row of the class and going up to Alexis. And all of a sudden she said, before I could get within five feet of her, she says that, don't talk to me. I went, all right. All right. And so I looked at Bianca and I said like this, meaning keep going. I took off the microphone, put it off to the side, and I just started working out next to her. Not talking. I'm about four feet away. Just showing her actions. I'm showing her love in the form of actions. Not in what I'm saying, but just that I'm in the foxhole 
with my friend. She is my battle buddy. And I'm just going to work out. So 30 minutes into the class, just wrapped it up, thinking, okay, I'm just going to let it go. The very next day, I'm sitting here giving an opening to the middle of, uh, to the people that were in the class. And she breaks through the crowd, walks within two feet of me and says, thank you very much. You never know what's going on right there in the heart. But sometimes you need to show love. And I'm quoting the five love languages by Carrie, Gary Chapman. And uh, I'm quoting the uh, love language that I thrive on the most, which is called acts of service. And I was just showing her, her the love and grace through my own actions was what she needed to have as a point of connection. And so if you wonder what's going on there and maybe what you're saying isn't working, just show with your actions. All right, Janessa, what do you say we move on to some takeaway strategies? Sounds great. Unless uh, you've got a question in there that's just way has to be answered right now, or we can hold it to the end. Yeah, no, I think some of these, all these questions, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, David. Um, we are going to address maybe at the end, if it's that okay. Yeah, so yeah, that's what we really want to do because, you know, this can go a number of different directions. You know, it can even become a coaching session, and that's great. That's awesome. Uh, as long as people are going to be impacted and empowered. I know I've said that about Absolutely. seven times today. Absolutely. Outstanding. Good. All right. So part two of Strength in a Storm, Finding fortitude in the face of fear. Can you tell I love alliteration? All right, so, so let's talk about the seven superior strategies to create connection in a crisis. This is an excerpt from something that I'm writing called the Social Distancing Survival Guide. Number one, embrace empathy. Some people confuse empathy with pity, sympathy, or compassion. Empathy is the ability to understand how someone is feeling through, through shared emotions and understanding their perspective, even if you feel differently about the situation. You see, there, 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 there are four different levels of engagement when reacting to another person's problems. Number one is pity. I recognize your pain. Number two is sympathy. I care about your pain. C, or number three, empathy. I feel your pain. And then, of course, the best course of action when you've, you know, you've exercised empathy correctly is that compassion, number four, I want to relieve you of your pain. But now, hear me out on this one. Some, sometimes people don't want to be fixed. I'm, I'm going to do a little sidebar here. Sometimes people don't want to be fixed. They want to be heard. They want to be understood. They want to be felt. They want to be on the same level with you. So compassion is a tricky thing. You want to make certain that you sometimes, you know what? My wife taught me this. One time, one time I was in China and um, I had just arrived after 30 hours of travel and I'm at the hotel room and, and I'm, you know, making certain I'm talking to my wife and she's ranting about something my son had done and they're just driving her nuts because uh, he so he seems to do that when I, you know, try and get out of town. And, uh, you know, she was handling things wonderfully. But, you know, I'm the typical guy and it's like, I got a solution for this. I got a solution. I got a solution for this. And so, but I realized that was my head voice. Again, like John C. Maxwell said, if you want to lead others, use your heart. If you want to lead yourself, use your head. And so I thought to myself, wait a minute, hold on here. Hey, honey, is this one of those times where I'm just supposed to kind of listen and, and, and work with you on this through some active listening? Or do you want a solution? No, oh, honey, just listen. I said, okay, I got it. Okay. All right. So, because really that was just a funny way of me saying that, you know, you've got to balance this because nobody wants pity or sympathy and especially during a crisis relationships are supported and strengthened by shared emotions which is empathy and when possible when possible and when probable helping to produce progress over pain that's compassion number two push for perspective you see issues become problems when you fail to accept them or when you refuse to acknowledge that you are not perfect and that some situations are beyond your control there are three steps to to produce progress from problems a acknowledge 
acknowledge what the problem is and, and for what it is. B, accept. Accept the problem as something that you can repair or have resolved that it is beyond your control. And C, address. Address the problem with action. Acknowledge, accept, address. For example, here it is, we have, like I told you in the very beginning during the introduction, unless you're kind of tuning in now, um, you know, I, I talked about how I was sitting there getting ready for this uh, workshop, excited, excited to bring this workshop uh, to you. And, and we got hit with two tornadoes and a bunch of uh, super storms, and I've still been without power for three days. I'm at my friend's house right now. God bless them. It's, been, it's an amazing that we're making this work, right? But I can either let the situation make me bitter or better. So I had resolved that this was something beyond my control. What could I control? Fired up the generator, fueled it up, fired it up, and now I got my refrigerator. I still got cold food that's not going bad. I got solar panels out there because I got the sun. So I'm powering of small electronics, but everything else, I can't control it. So I had resolved that I can't control it. And that's the key. Acknowledge, accept, address. Number three, cultivate confidence. Build bold and beautiful body language. Now, everyone right now is trying to put out Facebook Live or whatever way you can still connect with people. I need to go ahead, since this is a, an excerpt from the Social Distancing Survival Guide, I'm gonna quote something from something that I'm working with with CanFit Pro, which is called the Virtual Presentation Playbook. I say again, I've been a public speaker for a long time, but we're creating a new program called the Virtual Presentation Playbook. We're gonna have a small little webinar we're gonna do for everybody, and, and then we're gonna have a certification so that we can teach everyone how to do this. So your posture tells people the way you feel about them. Now, hear me again. You may be having a tough time right now, like I'm having a tough time right now, but your posture tells them the way you feel about them. So if you stand with good posture, if you angle the laptop or whatever it is that has that webcam, the phone, whatever it is, down instead of up, looking at plus. This is not too flattering to have it looking up anyway. Kind of makes our faces look a little larger. If you show beautiful and bold body language, the proper posture will help your body to also function better, allowing you to respond to situations with more strength and stamina. Your body language also communicates the way you feel inside and the way you feel about them. You will have an easier time connecting with other people by presenting yourself with powerful posture. Number four. Have humility. Oh, goodness. A crisis can, can provide you the opportunity to share the real you more than ever before. Your family and friends will love your acts of transparency. You know, we are filming some workout programs the other day, and I said that, you know, we need to go ahead and also keep the bloopers, because the bloopers, I think, are some of the most fun and foundational ways of showing your family and your followers that, you know, really how human you really are. And we flourish through our flaws by turning our frustration into fascination. To have humility is to realize that it takes imperfection to see perfection. Number five, create a climate of consistency. Okay, so, I had some person on a previous call say, well, I got some advice from my sister. And I love this person. She might even be on the call right now. I love this person. I'm not gonna mention her by name, but I love this person. And, and she said her sister gave her advice just to go ahead and to deal with the depression just by, uh, and what's going on right now by sleeping to as far as you want to in the day. Don't keep an alarm clock. Don't wake up at a regular schedule. Just go ahead and sleep in. And I said, hold on here. There are three ways to do coaching, formal coaching. You've got standard psychological health or, and behavioral uh, science. So, so that is where you give guided interrogatives to get them on track and help them 
unpack their own solution. You don't tell them the solution on standard coaching. Then you've got resilience training, which is where we realize we're all dealing with stress. And how do we turn that stress into strength? How do we turn that adversity into an advantage? Okay. Then you've got strategic intervention. You know who's really good at that? Tony Robbins. He's probably one of the best. And so an intervention is really risky, but I said, hey, look, hey, hell, hello, friend. I love you, and I'm always going to love you no matter what. But I got to tell you, your sister's just probably trying to share some love with you as well. But I, I, she's wrong. She's wrong. You need to wake up at a regular time, no matter what it takes, every single day, even though you don't have a regular schedule. And you need to wake up with a zest about you as if you are a child on Christmas morning. You ever see a child on Christmas morning hit the snooze button? No, absolutely not. A child on Christmas morning is going to come and wake you up and say, it's Christmas. And that's the way you should wake up every single day. And I already told you about starting your day with at least an hour of professional development, at least an hour of professional development, because you need to make certain that you are able to fill something in you, that cup of life, so that you have more to share that cup with others. You know, on May uh, 17, 2014, a U.S. Navy SEAL Admiral, William McRaven, shared his views about making your bed each morning, something I'm still making my 10-year-old son do now that he's homeschooling, and that homeschooling is probably going to last a long time. And he, and he said, during his commencement address to the graduates of the University of Texas, I'm going to go ahead and read what he said. He says, every morning in basic SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they would inspect was your bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers pulled tight, the pillows centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. That's Navy talk for bed. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough battle-hardened seals, but the wisdom of this simple act has proven to me time and time again. You see, if, if you make your bed in the morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It'll give you a small sense of pride, and it'll encourage you to do another task and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many other tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things matter in life. If you can't do little things right, you'll never do the big things right. And if by some chance you have a miserable day and you come home to a bed that is made, that you made, and made that bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. Number six, restore resilience. What you put into your eyes and ears is an, can have an imprint on your very soul. You can either choose to see things and hear things that will lift you up or to tear you down. I already talked about starting your day with at least an hour of professional development. I'm going to add to that and piggyback that. Um, you know, you need to make certain that you always get a daily dose of positive mental nutrition. You know, like, for example, um, what are the last 10 books that you've read? Oh, how about this? Put a couple of them in the uh, chat box right now, and we're going to talk about those. What are the last 10 books that you read? And I know that this might be an eye opener for many of you right now because it's a fact. According to the University of Pennsylvania School of Positive Psychology, when they were doing research for the resilience training program, there's one of the things that they researched. They said that, you know, that a lot of people are not practicing positive daily mental nutrition. What's happening is, is, is that 97% of the people in the nation, in, in the nation of the USA, at least where they did the research, uh, have probably won't read another book after high school. 97%. That means only 3% of the people in the USA, according to their poll, 
We'll read another book after high school. What you put in your eyes and your ears has an imprint on your very soul. It'll either lift you up or tear you down. That's a fact. What are you listening to when you work out? Has it got derogatory lyrics? You may be able to overcome that, but guess what? Something inside might get triggered. And it can be seen. Start listening to podcasts by people that have positive messages, messages that will fuel your fire each day. Start a reading club. Resilience means to challenge your limits instead of limiting your challenges. And finally, number seven, my wife's favorite from her book, Everything I Would Have Said, Champion Change. Are you living by results or reasons why you won't dive into your dreams? A crisis is the perfect time to emerge as something better than before. There are three simple steps to surface stronger when the storm subsides. Number one, dream. It's a shame that it took a crisis to remind us how to dream again. Number two, develop. This means that you will need to take some risks to grow, both personally and professionally. And number three, deliver. This means that you will need to put action behind your aim and create your new career with what you have already. And if you need more uh, you know, discussion about intentionality, read the book Intentional Living by John C. Maxwell. It will change your life. Because the bottom line is this, the reason why many people won't become who they want is because they're too attached to who they have been. I say again, the reason why many people won't become who they want is because they're too attached to who they have been. Now, before we get into a conclusion and a wrap up, we want to make this interactive. Janessa, I want to call the mic back to you again, and let's see if we've got some more questions that came in that are just getting people fired up. Yeah, I mean, I can't, first I have to say by saying we have the most amazing community here. Um, thank you, everybody. I have a new reading list now, and I am definitely picking up some of those ones you mentioned in the chat room, so thank you. Um, so. Uh, let's get to some of the questions here. I'm just pulling it up. Uh, we have from Renata, what are the three next, or sorry, what are the next steps for students stuck at stage two or of the three behavioral stages? How do we move people forward? Mm. Okay, so we're talking about, um, uh, in the beginning, we were talking about the three stages of behavior change. Is that what the question is? That's correct, yeah. Okay, and she said when people are stuck at stage two, of the three stages. Okay, all right. So, so in stage two, again, in stage two, um, pursue life giving actively. I say again, pursue life giving actively. And then you will easily, easily transition into stage three. This is key. Pursue life giving actively. Uh, you know, that kind of goes into a champion change too, because when we get stuck in there, we, we, we have, we, we're, we're, we're stuck in a fixed mindset. How do we turn things into a growth mindset? And it reminds me, it reminds me of the story because I, you know, there was this um, Dr. Carol Dweck who wrote the book Mindset. She created, you know, she really was the first to kind of break down what mindset really means. And in her book, Mindset, she says, really, what makes a person who they are? What, like when a person comes in and in the high school and says, today we're doing a pop math test. And you've got the majority of the people that says, oh no, I'm gonna fail, a fixed mindset. And what, what, what about that one person that says that, wow, that's not frustrating, that's fascinating. This is exciting. What's about that one person that makes that person into a growth mindset that can easily get into stage three? That's because you've got to pursue life-giving activities in your life. So what I would say to that person, Renata, is that, that you know, look into what's going on with that person if it's, if it's, if it's outside her own uh, inner circle and that she's talking about a client or some kind. And let's see, see that um, ask yourself, is this, bringing my, um, is this bringing my body uh, into a point of um, 
growth? Uh, is, uh, am I doing the right things? Am I fo focusing on the right nutrition? Am I waking up and I'm doing professional development? Am I setting up a goal list? You know, one thing's, uh, here, here's one thing I can tell Renata too, is that I tell all of my clients, I call them team members. I don't like, even like the word client. It means business to me, but I tell my team members, my friends and family, I tell them, look, you need to go ahead and set up an active list of 150 goals that you want to accomplish in your life. I say again, 150 goals that you want to accomplish in your life. And then people will say, wait a minute, 150 goals? Are you, are, are you serious? Because they're looking at the fixed mindset that, oh, I can never come up with 150. So let's turn it and twist it and look at a different perspective. Look beyond the veil. Who wants to live another 30 years of productive life? Put it in a chat bar and say, yes, if you want, if you have desire to live another 30 years of productive life, put it in the chat bar right now. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So let's do the math. What's 150 divided by 30? Five. Five. Five goals a year. Everyone can handle five goals a year. You see, when you take that 150 goals, because you know who you are, and that's the key thing. Let's take a step back here. The reason why some people don't make these growth mindset goals and they just put things that are on their bucket list, which is great for entertainment, but it doesn't build the who and the why. You see, that's the point. If you know your why, the way to get there will be easy. And then a lot of people don't know who they are and they're out there telling people out there what to do. And this might be a big eye opener for some people here because you've got to take a look at it and knowing who you are is like carving a block of clay into an elephant in an, in an art class. So let's just say you're in an art class for the first time and you've got this block of clay and the block of, you've got the chisels, you've got all the uh, utensils, it's on a piece of paper, you've got a block of clay. Now, what do you think you might need to carve that block of clay into an elephant for the first time that you've ever done this? A picture. A picture of what it is. Because if you don't have the picture, what you're gonna do is you're gonna chip away at that block of clay and what's gonna happen is, is that when you're all said and done, it doesn't look like what you imagine it to be. And isn't that how some of us are running our lives? You don't have to have it all figured out to f pursue your purpose, you don't. So just remember, just remember, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Who are you? You know, Picasso was named famous for this one quote, that the purpose of, that the, that the mission in life is to find your gift, but the purpose of life is to give it away. Most of us in the service industry, we feel the same way, that the mission of life is to find your gift, but the purpose of life is to give it away. But in order to do that, you got to know your why. And your why is represented in your vision and your goals support your vision and your tasks support your goals. There's a hierarchy. Your vision is your why, why you exist on this planet. And if you know your why, again, like John C. Maxwell said, the way to get there will be easy. So all I can say is that once you dig a little bit into that self-discovery in yourself and the self-discovery of your client, assuming it's your client, stage three will surface. All right. What else you got, Janessa? All right, um, so we've got some things from, let's see here. We've got- I really, while you're looking for it, folks, you're all doing a great job. There's over, you know, there's well over 200 people on this active call and there's gonna be probably a good thousand that are gonna watch the recording later because CanFit Pro is gonna make certain you have this recording. We yeah. really want to impact and empower you with some, you know, some things that you can use for yourself, your family and your followers and friends. Yeah, absolutely. Such amazing points. I'm actually now very conscious about where my webcam is and how I'm being presented here. So um, our next question, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I know all the tools of self-care, but I feel I'm missing something. How can I find a new perspective so I can move past my struggles? Okay, so 
Jennifer wants a new perspective. She already understands some resilience co uh, competencies, it sounds like. So, but let me go ahead and give her some, um, some things that I focus on when I am dealing with adversity and I'm trying to turn it into an advantage. I kind of fall back on what Dr. Martin Seligman taught me at the University of Pennsylvania School of Positive Psychology. He says, when you are running into an obstacle of any kind, you got to focus on these uh, resilience competencies. The resilience competencies that he refers to as like, you know, self-awareness, self-regulation, connection, optimism. When you focus on any of these resilience competencies, and he, he goes on to elaborate on a lot of these competencies, when you focus on them and any one of them in a given situation, you can internalize that situation, find new perspective, and your outlook on life will be different. Now, Sometimes your environment's not so kind. Now, what if you're dealing with things pretty well and you're able to kind of manage your, your stress and turn that stress into strength, but what if you know, the people around you are saying, oh boy, things really are horrible right now. I don't know. We're all dealing with it. And because this is what fear mongering really is. And in order for us in, in this world that we're living in to focus on a new perspective, perhaps you need to use what is called real time resilience in the form of either perspective, optimism, or evidence. For example, like the next time someone comes up to me and says, man, this really, this is, this is just tough. Well, one response might be to say, um, you're right. It is. But the most, the most likely implication is that the best things in life are on the other side of struggle. And that is the example in real-time resilience of perspective. You see, do you understand what I just did here? I didn't argue with the person and debate with the person about their views. I gave that person value by also agreeing with their statement and I made them feel significant and important by what they were saying and taking it in. And, but it's like a wrestler or a judo expert. When you're being thrown by somebody, you don't resist against them. You go with them in their turn in the way that, in the direction that they're throwing you. Because what happens is, is that you will throw them off balance. And when you do, it'll stop the argument. So right away, giving that person credit, giving that person significance and value and credit in the current situation. The person said that, oh man, isn't this horrible? And I said, you're right, it is. It stopped the argument right away. But then I said that, you know, the most likely implication is, is that the best things in life are on the other side of struggle. Because again, what I said in the beginning, there are only two things that can happen to you when you face adversity of any kind, fall apart, and bounce back. So I ask you this, do you bounce back to where you were before? No, because you bounce back better. All right, Janessa, uh, I think we have time for one more question live like this, and then we're gonna do a wrap up and, uh, and, uh, and you can monitor the questions in the meantime, see if anything else yeah. really pops up. Sound absolutely. Good? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think actually, finally, our last question will be um, how members can follow or get in touch with you because there are a couple mm -hmm. of questions. There are way, way a lot of questions actually that um, which are amazing. Okay. Um, and it, people are asking how to get in touch with you. Great question. And because, you know, we really feel, we really feel like we're only chipping off the tip of the iceberg here. And really what's going on with people's lives is like an iceberg itself. I mean, what's really the biggest part of an iceberg It's what's below the surface. And uh, having said that, there's so much more that we can do on this journey of joy together by pursuing healing and then on the road to happiness. Uh, so, you know, I wanna go ahead and get personal with you here because um, again, when I was, uh, it was March 7th and I was in Boston, uh, Massachusetts in the USA and I was doing a brand new course I wrote for jump sport trampolines called the Jump Sport Boot Camp Coach Course. Yep. And uh, it went well, it was extremely well. We were doing it at Reebok headquarters, a wonderful experience. But you know, I remember when I finished, I was giving an update to my wife and she said, hey honey, they sent Anderson home from school. I went, 
ooh, okay, I could see the writing on the wall. So I called my military friends from the civil support team. And I said, hey, what do you know? The civil support team for us in the uh, state of Tennessee, they handle nuclear, biological, and chemical defense. And, um, and so um, they said, that, hey, this is a real thing. So when we were getting back, when I was getting back, I was really trying to manage what's going on by immediately going into homeschooling and then uh, trying to say, okay, how are we going to transition? We were going to do virtual training, but it was kind of two years off in the picture, but now it's become a need to go now. All right. And so we were doing it, but something didn't settle right in our hearts. Our head said, let's do this now. But our heart said, mm, it doesn't feel right to ask for money in March. It doesn't feel right to sit there and pull our friends into this, into this whole thing in April. It didn't feel right. And then I start, you know, I've trained over uh, 4,400 people in 35 four countries over the last seven years in leading boot camp instructor certification courses. And I started getting flooded with my, you know, my group uh, from all over the world. And I remember Archie Nellis reaching out to me from the Philippines and saying that he has to get up first thing early in the morning to get on his motorcycle before dawn, ride three hours to wait in line for a loaf of bread that takes him another three hours. That puts things in perspective. So my wife and I, we kind of prayed on it. We said, how, 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 can we, how can we help others? How can we put other people's needs before our own? And that was the birth of Project HOPE. HOPE stands for Help Other People Endure. It's a nonprofit that we put together where every two weeks, we do these free webinars that are CEC approved, right? American Council on Exercise approved and soon to be CanFit Pro approved. Free webinars every two weeks on a Tuesday evening where we have seven, six or seven speakers, depending on what the content is, that are all giving TED Talk style programs on inspiration and hope, which all serve as takeaways on how we can change people's lives. So if you haven't heard of Project Hope to help other people endure, we have a uh, Facebook page. It'll both be on both on the handout and you can also kind of Google it right now. Help other people endure Project Hope. Now, during the time that we are dealing with the COVID crisis, my wife graciously wanted to also help one step further than Project Hope. And Project Hope, by the way, is growing exponentially. We now are going to be on May 15th. We have our Project Hope webinar tonight at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern, um, which is 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific, and uh, which is 7 a.m. in the Philippines. Um, and so we have, uh, and which is the 6th of May, of course, not the 5th of May. So while Project Hope is uh, May 15th, we're doing Project Hope Singapore. Uh, we're going to do Project Hope Philippines. We're going to do Project Hope. We're using their speakers. I'll play the host, and we're going to just keep this journey going. Now, during this time, my wife is also wanting to kind of, you know, do more. During this COVID crisis for a limited time, she's offering her Kindle version of her book, Everything I Would Have Said, for 99 cents US. That's right, 99 cents US. It's the best that we could do. It's actually the minimum that we could do to actually have it active on Amazon.com. And so, so make certain that you take advantage of that. Lastly, reach out to us. My wife can be found at Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E at startfitness.com, S-T-A-R-T-F-I-T-N-E-S-S.com, or you can look her up at stephaniewikert.com, and you, she's uh, got several life coaching certifications, and she's, uh, she's actually taking on uh, new clients because everything has changed recently. And um, she's doing a special project where she's trying to, uh, you know, work on her own accreditation and her, new, her own CECs, her continuing education credits. And me, Sergeant Ken at SergeantKen.com, S-G-T-K-E-N at S-G-T-K-E-N.com. Be happy to talk to you further about what's going on because we're in this together. Janessa. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, Sergeant Ken, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from, again, Nashville, Tennessee, where 
literally, it's not a metaphor. There is a storm and so many people out there are without power during a pandemic. So thank you. Good. I have a five minute close though. I want to make certain we squeeze it in. I know we're five minutes past. Is that okay? <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. Just what, um, and also want to join again, we have the best community here. Yes, so you do. Engaged, so inspired and so inspiring. So yeah, what Janessa is saying is just before we got on this call with all of you, we were doing a tech test. And I said that, you know, out of all the places that I've ever been to in the world, there are three countries that stand out as really having a love for learning more than the other 30 uh, four countries that I've been to. Uh, and I've got to say the Philippines, Canada stands still really neck and neck in, in number one, and Lebanon. Um, because what, you know, the resilience and love for learning that I see in Canadians, uh, Filipinos, and the great people of Lebanon, uh, you know, nothing against the other countries, but it's just, it's just second to none. Go on, Jan uh, Janessa. Thank you, thank you. Um, so again, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, we hope you stick with us for the rest of Mental Health Wellness Week. There are oh, yes. other webinars happening. Uh, details, if you don't have any, um, you can find them on our Facebook page, on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, and we will see you next time. All and right, and before you sign off, it. the conclusion. <laughs> the conclusion. Here we go. Born in 1768 in present-day Ohio, USA, Native American Indian Chief Tecumseh lived during an era of near constant conflict with his Shawnee tribe and white frontiersmen. At the end of a battle and on his deathbed, he allegedly told his son the following. So live your life that fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion, respect others in their view, and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over to the great divide. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger, when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food or for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision when it comes your time to die be not like those hearts who are filled with the fear of death so that when their time comes they weep and will pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way Sing your life death song, sing your death song, and die a hero going home. A new perception we can have is that we have opportunities, not obstacles right now. How do you want to be remembered when the storm subsides? You can be the person that people talk about. She or he had immense fortitude in the face of fear during the virus crisis. She or he not only made me look good, but made me feel good. Wrap it up there, Janessa. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, again, you can find details on social, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You have uh, Sergeant Ken's uh, website. I think it's in the chat. And again, you will be receiving an email after this webinar with this recording, how to access the recording. And the handout. These slides and handouts, yes. And any links uh, pertinent that, uh, that are pertinent and that have been raised and brought to the forefront here at this uh, webinar. So thank you again so much. It's amazing. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time. We'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank Bye. you. Hoo <laughs> Who are?